All right, this is Joe Green um, in Mount Sydney, Virginia in May of 2015. And um, uh, over the years I've acquired a lot of uh, genealogy papers and old photos. I was wondering what to do with them. I knew they'd get thrown away someday and I thought if we put them on a DVD it would be nice to share them with relatives. This way they'd always have a copy and not so bulky. And looking through all these pictures, pictures you go back and you see pictures and you see real estate records and how many acres someone owned and things of that nature. Uh, things that make the court records. Sometimes that's all we have of folks. But it's kind of nice also to have some stories of people in past generations where that's possible. So I tried to add that to this uh, material. Um, I want to thank John Brake of Greenville who wrote uh, The History of Greenville, which is a marvelous book on the Greenville area where all of this occurs. And also Mr. James E. Dow of Colorado Springs, Colorado for his huge research in the Dow family. And we'll show you soon how they all hook together and also want to thank Granny Vines for recording her journal from the 1870s to the 1930s. And I want to apologize to all those folks too because in looking at these materials I found out there are a lot of discrepancies in uh, names and dates and times. And I apologize to folks if I don't get it quite right. Um, so this is mainly about the Vines line and the Vines family but there's always a mystery that back down the road uh, there was a Dow family that was involved with us and um, usually when you're following your family name you go way back to your great 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 grandfather but in this particular case uh, we're going to go back to the matriarch of the Vines line or where the Vines name came from and it was a lady it was her great 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 grandmother and we'll see if we can trace that through all of this occurs in and around, well, winds up in and around um, Greenville, Virginia. And um, a lot of the pictures, when we get to that, the fun part down the road, the pictures will be from the Greenville area, the actual photographs. There are a number of uh, pictures in here to help you not fall asleep. Um, here's the Vines family crest. And uh, the first person we're going to really talk about is uh, Virginia Ann Vines. She was known as Annie, and um, she was born, I think, right on the edge of Rockbridge County, where Rockbridge County comes together um, with Augusta County, and she was the second of five children. Um, she uh, ran a boarding house, actually, uh, near a big forge. Uh, it was called the Clay Forge. It was in an area where Augusta, Amherst, Rockbridge, and Nelson counties come together on the west side of the Blue Ridge. She and her sisters, two of her sisters and her father, also worked at this Clay Forge near Vesuvius. And we'll learn more about Clay Forges in just a moment. Um, Annie was the common law wife of a major Dow. We'll meet him later, too. And... Um, because she was a common law, uh, they had four children that were from a common law marriage. Virginia law states that their last name would be Vines and not Dow. So they're named after um, the mother. They take the mother's surname, but not the father. Uh, these children have no right to sue their father for inheritance at all, although that he did endow each of them, as we'll see. And they had they had four children all. She died in uh, 18... Uh, around 1850 or 1860 and um, so by our surname all the family out there that's named Vines uh, uh, has Vines for a surname and genetically we actually come from the Dow line so we want to go back and see um, first of all we're going to follow the, the Vines line so this is going to follow the Vines family down to Annie. So Annie's waiting on us here in Augusta County and we're going to go back and see where all her relatives came from. Most of the vines uh, that came over very very early came from Cornwall or Devonshire, England. Some also from London. And the first fellow we know about was John Vines. We think he was born about 1615. He came to Virginia between 16 
40 and 1650. At that time, the population of Virginia uh, was listed as males. There were 500 males in the state of Virginia in 1650 when John arrived. And his name appears um, in the records of Lancaster County, Virginia, in May of 1653. He purchased 650 acres in uh, Northampton County, um, land where Bridgetown was located near a bridge crossing Hungers Creek. Um, at that time, there were no courthouses, so court was ordered to be held in his home in 1661. This is not his court, not his home. It's just an example. His wife, we don't know who his wife was, but he had three children in England, and uh, he brought the children with him, and we follow the lines of Thomas Vines I. So Thomas Vines I came with his dad. He was born in England in 1643, came with his dad to Northampton County uh, sometime between 16. 45 and 1653. And uh, basically these vines were tobacco farmers in this area. We assume they were all farming. Uh, they moved to York County uh, and Thomas Vines the first had one son who was Thomas Vines the second. He was born in 1674 in York County near Essex House. Uh, he was a tobacco planter. He had over 200 acres in York County there. He married a Mary Hill in 1693. He died in 1737. Um, they also probably did some raised corn, etc., as all these other farmers did. And we follow Thomas Vines III, who was born in 1695 in York County, married Ann Mitchell, uh, about 1720, and had five children. Thomas Vines uh, died, the third died in 1732 in Surrey County, Virginia. He was only 37 years old. Um, next is Thomas Vines IV, who was born in 1722 in York County and he lived with his grandfather because his father died early. And on his second marriage, he married a Mary Wynn Butler. They had eight children all around Albemarle Parish of Surrey County and they moved all the way west to Amherst County and um, near Augusta County also. So um, we come to Thomas Vines V, and if you remember Annie, remember Annie who was running that? This is her father. She was running the boarding house. So this is Thomas Vines V as her father. He was born in 1761 in Augusta County uh, after Thomas IV moved up towards Amherst in Augusta. He married uh, Anna Smith, 1774. He died in 1837. He joined the, uh, the army, the Revolutionary Army, when he was less than 20 years old. He was a guard for um, prisoners in Charlottesville at the Barracks Road, sort of where the Barracks Road Shopping Center is, if you know that today. He was in the battles of Hot Water, Green Spring, under Matt, uh, General Matt Anthony Wayne, and he served at the Siege of Yorktown. And after the, more, after the war, <clears throat> Thomas moved to the Greenville area, so we moved back to the valley, he moved back to the Greenville area, and he worked at that clay forge. He worked at a clay forge, and he had five children there. And the second of those was Virginia Ann Vines. So we're back in Virginia with Virginia Ann, and now we're going to look at this mysterious Dow family and how um, we became related with them. Uh, the surname, surname of Dal comes from Scotland, possibly Ireland. Ireland. There's so many Scotch-Irish around in Virginia, probably a little bit of both, hard to separate them out. It was perhaps a clan in the area of Galway, Scotland. And uh, there were many variations on the name. The furthest back we know is John Dow, and uh, he was born in 1695. Um, this is taken from the book of Albemarle County in Virginia by Reverend Edgar Woods. John Dow was one of the early pioneers who broke virgin soil in the county of Albemarle. He obtained a patent for 400 acres on Pretty's Creek in 1738, and up to 1759 he received grants of more than 1,000 acres. Some were grants from King George II. He died during the Revolutionary War. He had four sons. He lived about five miles from uh, Monticello. 
uh, he had 10 children. And the third of these children was Thomas Dow, uh, who is the um, great, 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 great grandfather, great, great, great grandfather of James Dow out in Colorado, the genealogist who gave us all the Dow's information. The one we follow is the fourth child, who was John Dow Jr. So here we are in Albemarle County on the photos. Uh, you also see how um, they were early pioneers for Albemarle County, some of the very first settlers. John Dow uh, inherited 250 acres from his father and eventually owned over 1,600 acres, which is why his name appears in the, in the ledgers. He was born in 1740 around Greenfield, of Virginia in Orange County. He died in 1798 in Advance Mill, Albemarle County, and he married an Anne Franklin in 1757 and was born in 1740, died in 1802 in the town of Prophet, Albemarle County. Uh, John owned land near Pretty's Creek and other places. Interesting story on John Jr. in 1779 Tories uh, broke into his house and took all the personal belongings, about $5,000 in gold and silver, $500 in pewter, a barrel of brandy. They burnt down the house and they left John for dead. He lived, but he was never the same, and his neighbors rebuilt a cabin for them there. John Jr. had 10 um, children, and the oldest was Major Dow, who was born in 1760. And Major Dow, Major A. Dow, is the guy who's going to marry Virginia Ann Vines. We just got to get him over the mountain from Albemarle into the valley. Um, he died in 1837. He was the son of John Dow, Jr. And we, and we believe um, um, there was a Mary Major who married John Dow, Sr. It may have been a Major. It may not have been. But because the name Major Vines does not mean he had rank in the Continental Army. It is just a family name. So he has a really kind of a wild and interesting life um, before he comes over to Augusta County. Uh, records show that he married a Francis Jones, I assume in Albemarle County, about October 1st, 1804. Their children were Virginia Dow and John E. Dow. There is also a record that shows he had a wife who was named Elizabeth Martin. I don't know much about that. So um, John was an interesting guy um, and uh, into a lot of different things. In the Revolution, he joined the Army. He was Private Number 3061. He served in the Albemarle County area as a blacksmith. And there were blacksmith areas out by that prison. And it's very interesting that uh, Major Dow may have run into Annie's father, Thomas Vines V. They may have run into each other there because they're going to work together pretty soon. Sometime after the Revolution, he finally moved into the Shenandoah Valley and became an extensive landowner. He owned approximately 17,000 acres, and some people say there was much, much, much more. Some, Most of this was, I think, in the Vesuvius area. Some of the records say it was near Waynesboro on both sides of the South River. Well, there are actually two South Rivers. One goes to the Shenandoah, one goes to the Jame. Some says it's at the confluence of the Nelson, Amherst, and Augusta and Rockbridge counties. This would put it right near Vesuvius, Virginia, which is known for um, a lot of foundries and things that uh, that he owned. The criteria for a foundry, he owned the clay found foundry. He was the iron master. He was the owner and the operator of this foundry. And the way it worked was you could transport the iron ore from almost anywhere, but you couldn't transport the, the forest or the lumber. It would take 200 acres of woods to make enough charcoal to run a foundry for one year. So you had to have water to run the bellows. Uh, so there was a water running through Vesuvius with the river there. There was a huge forest there, which may be why Major Dow was buying up all this land. It was probably real cheap. And when you built a, um, a foundry like that, it almost became a little city. You had uh, lots and lots of workers. Uh, you had people cutting trees. You had people doing the pig iron and uh, work in the foundry. And you would have enough need to have even a boarding house. And there would be small schools and stores and everything. So uh, that came together around Vesuvius. And I think maybe that's where... 
um, where uh, John, I mean Major Dow, was living when he uh, met Virginia and Vines and her sisters who were employed there and Thomas Vines the fifth. Um, but one of the other interesting things is even though um, Major Dow was an extensive landowner, um, when he died, he uh, left land only to Virginia and Vines and their four children. Um, he left a thousand acres each to them. Uh, there are various legal things that happened in Lynchburg, Virginia. You can see where there were some lawsuits and some 9,000 acres was given up because of uh, taxes weren't paid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a little unclear. It would be interesting to look at the, at the real estate of Major Dow. And just because there's so many relatives, um, uh, just for a second I'll talk about the children of Major Dow and Virginia Ann Vines. One was Coleman Dow, born in 1804. Abraham Vines was born in 1812. He's an interesting character. He became a cabinet maker in Richmond, Virginia. He married Sarah Park Brake. He, um, they moved west to Indiana. He owned most of the land around Fort Benjamin Harrison and also uh, most of what is now Lawrence, Indiana. He started a, a religious school. He lived in a home called Vines Spring in Ripley County. And over his lifetime, he had three wives and a total of 24 children, some of which died when they were quite young. Our, um, the, oh, the last child was Jane Vines, uh, who married a Williams Grooms and... Um, he was a butcher, and they had ran a stagecoach stop near Tinkling Springs Church. Our line, and we're going to finally now get done with all this uh, genealogy stuff. I tried to get through it really rapidly. His second son was Major Dow Vines, and this is his actual picture. Major Dow Vines was born July 22, 1811, died December 3, 1887. He was the second son of Major Dow in Virginia and Vines. He likely worked at the foundry of his father. I think he probably likely farmed after that. It's a little bit unclear. Uh, he may be a chip off the block. He kind of looks like a rascal. And uh, Mr. Brake said that he was kind of a rounder um, and that his son would uh, bring a lot of deliveries from the Bumgardner, Bumgardner establishment in Greenville uh, to him every week. Um, he married on September 19, 1831, Margaret and Newton. Both were 20 years old. And uh, Margaret was born also May 2nd, born in 1811 on May the 2nd. And she died October 23rd, 1870. She was, she was the daughter of James A. Newton and Mary Siler. And the Newton family was really prominent and respected in Greenville. Her brothers were attorneys. Uh, her other brother was a, a captain. Uh, in the Confederate Army when they marched off. Here's her picture. Mary Newton. I mean, excuse me, Margaret Newton. And this is, is a picture of the Dow home in Greenville. I'm sorry there's so many trees around. It's really a nice home. And if you ever want to go see it today or at any time, at least at this time, the, the address is 77 Main Street, Greenville. Virginia. The line that we follow from those two is I, it comes to Isaac Newton Vines and uh, this picture is Isaac Newton Vines on the left with the dog and also Granny Vines on the right. Uh, Isaac Newton wasn't named for the famous uh, philosopher, uh, phys physicist, and mathematician. He was, uh, Newton was a family name of his mother and the Isaac runs down through the lines also. He was born October 7th, 1834. He died December 12th, 18... I'm sorry, he was married December 12th, 1867 to Narcissus, Virginia Height, and he died... Um, actually, according to Granny Vine's journal, his wife wrote, he died on sun Sunday, November 23rd, 1934, 1913, just before 8 o'clock a.m., uh, Isaac was known as Ike to his friends. He was a wonderful man. He was very community-oriented. Uh, community he was a farmer. He was a tanner. He worked with lumber. He was a barker. He was a shoemaker. He cut hair. He made shoes. He farmed. He did what he could to get along and get by. Um, and everybody at that time 
seemed to do that to to uh, make a living. He uh, enlisted in the Southern Army on April 18, 1861. He was 27 years old. He was private in Company E of the 5th Virginia Infantry, which was part of the Stonewall Brigade. He was made. He was uh, promoted to corporal in 1862. And because he was experienced as a tanner and a shoemaker and a leather worker, he worked in the shops in Stanton and in, in small industries making saddles, making shoes, which were desperately needed for uh, the Confederate Army. He, um, they lived on uh, this house. It's on Poor Creek. I don't know why the name of the creek is Poor Creek. They probably had about 1,000 acres there or more. Um, the address, if you want to go see it, is 303 Greenville School Road and they lived in this house and um, he and Narcissus helped out the community always thought of others they graded a lot of roads they they would clean up the roads in the in the um, after the winter and did a lot of community service so his wife is Narcissus Virginia Heights Vines or Granny Vines she was born April 14 1844 uh, and she died September 27, 1932, at age 87. She was the daughter of Alexander Height and Elizabeth Beaton of Lexington, Virginia. My mother said she always said she was descended from the Jost Height line, which were very early settlers of the Shenandoah Valley, Bell Grove Plantation, etc. I have a really hand copied, very early map of these Height houses up in that area. She wrote a continuous journal of her life from 1877 to 1932. It's used at the Augusta County Historical Society now. It was used as a basis for some of the things at the Frontier Culture Museum. It's a really great journal. She was called Nars or Narcissus by her husband, uh, by folks in the in the town. Her husband called her Sis, and to many people, and as well as our family, she was known as Granny Vines. She was very calm and sensible, was well known, loved, and visited by many of the community, both black and white. She seldom left the farm. She helped her husband, took care of the house, sewed clothes, mended clothes, uh, and liked to take care of the people around her. She was a hard worker. There are several stories about her. Uh, my mother told me that she used to fight away the birds from the service fairy trees near her back door so she could make service fairy pies in the early spring. She'd load up her pie safe all most weekends with 12 to 16 pies on Friday, and by Sunday they were all gone, consumed by relatives and friends. Over the weekend, she always made sassafras tea in the spring. She always wore an apron. Uh, another tale was she skipped church one Sunday and went, went for a walk up Plore Creek and uh, was delighted to find a nest of turkey eggs, and she brought the eggs home and hatched them out and had all these little poults, and a few weeks later, a big old rainstorm came out, and uh, all the little turkeys ran out and turned their heads up and drowned. She always said that's what she got for, for skipping church. On June 6, 1864, Union General David Hunter entered Stanton with about 20,000 men. They burnt the railroad station. They destroyed warehouses and mills and workshops. And then they passed through Greenville a few days later on the way to burning VMI as those students had, uh, had participated in the new market battle. And they were short on rations, and they were living off the land, taking food from people as they went. As the Union soldiers were ransacking through the Vines' home, dumping out and emptying the furniture, a uh, 20-year-old Narcissus sort of sassed them by asking if they thought they were going to find any Confederate soldiers in those drawers. She and Ike had six children. Um, I'll name them here just for some of the relatives. Dora Irene, Jewett Wilson, who was Uncle Jewett, Eugene Franklin, whom I descend from, who was known as Monk, Charles Emmett, who had, I think he had seizures, he had some disabilities and didn't live until 25. And there was Elmer Guy Ned Vines, who was the um, Uncle Ned. And then uh, the last and the youngest was um, Viola. And Viola uh, was always sort of a legend in our, in our um, family. Uh, she had two dogs named Himmler and Hitler. Uh, she would put mouse traps in the cookie jar to see whose hands were were taking her cookies out, and uh, she would go to Greenville at night when her husband didn't come home until late, and she would um, run her husband down. These are the final pictures here of of uh, of Granny Vines, and this is quite an old 
quite a lot of candles on that cake, so she might have been getting pretty close to her 87 years of age for that birthday party. Um, the person that, the, that my direct line follows from is Eugene Franklin Vines. He was known as Captain, uh, but he had no military rank. He was also known as Monk or Monkey uh, because he was just a very small man. Um, he was born March uh, 2nd, 1873. He married Annie Valera Hubbard. We'll meet her in a little bit. And he died January 13th, 1952. When he married Annie, he was 34 and she was 16. Monk likely grew up as a farm boy in Greenville. He helped his dad. He also learned the, learned the grading trade with uh, grading roads and road beds and things of that nature. And uh, working for the highways, he would go as far away as Tennessee, uh, other places in Virginia, grading roads, grading railroad beds. And likely he got out to Bedford and uh, Virginia, and probably that's where he met his wife, Annie. Uh, there's one story of my mother told of the flu in 1918 when um, everybody was sick in the house with the flu. Um, they were they were um, really ill, and so was everyone else in the countryside. Monk did not get the flu. He would get up every morning. He would feed his family. He would water his livestock, take off on his horse, and uh, got to all as many neighbors as he could to feed their families, take care of their animals as long as the flu lasts. Um, he worked at a number of things. He ran a sawmill. He was a barker. They would sell bark off of trees. The chestnut trees were beginning to die at this time. They would sell bark uh, off on the railroads to be used in the tanning industry. Um, he ran a sawmill. He ran a, a filling st an early filling station. He had a number of jobs of that nature. He also uh, uh, had an apple orchard. Um, towards um, the end of his life, or after 1920 or 21, they had an apple, an apple uh, orchard when they lived on in Greenville. Um, he apparently initially um, lived on Poor Creek with Granny Vines, and then on October 22nd, 1908, according to his journals, he began to grade the lot for his home at Cold Spring. Uh, this home still stands. If you want to go see it, it's at 2851 Cold Spring Road. Um, several of the children, all of the children were born there except for Eva. And my mother was born in, um, in Bedford. We'll learn about that uh, in a moment. When he moved from this home, he moved into Greenville um, and he on Kings Hill and he um, dynamited out a lot of the chestnut stumps and converted Kings Hill into an orchard. In later life, he worked as a night guard in a state penitentiary. Uh, Monk Vines, in his later life, was a widower uh, and a friend. One of his friends was Milton Green, my other grandfather, who was a widower, and they were pals and rounders, and they probably make, create a lot of stories that we really don't want to know about. Uh, but they were friends with each other. Let's talk about Annie Valera Hubbard. She was born September 6, 1891. Married, went, married uh, to Monk Vines when she was 16 years old. And she died May 24, 1927. She was only... 36, so she was quite young. There's not a lot of history that we have on her. Her parents were John Leroy Hubbard and Martha Chafin of uh, Bedford County. She was a pretty lady. She was very kind. Apparently, she was a great musician. She could play nearly anything she picked up. Um, she was 36 when she died, and Monk apparently never never got over it. Um, this is a picture of, of um, Annie on the right in this photograph in the white blouse. They were building this home in Greenville, which is 4275 Lee Jackson Highway. And um, they were building in the midst of construction of that. Monk didn't build either of those houses, but I think he helped with them, helped grade the lots, etc. cetera. And um, um, after he died, the plumbing was never completed.
here's some pictures. Family pictures of them. Uh, this is Monk Vines on the left, Annie on the right. The little girl on the far right is my mother, Madeline. A uh, little girl on the left is Juanita or Nia. And little fella in the middle is um, William Vines. Another picture of uh, Annie. Uh, in this time, um, William is on the right. Little fellow on the right. The baby would be Eva. And Juanita is on the left. And they're standing uh, where the Greenville house is, probably just having been constructed. That's Route 11 going down into Greenville there. This photo is Annie with Eva as the baby. And um, I believe Juanita is standing, and that's Mary next to her, the small child on the far right. Uh, just in a quick aside, this is, this is um, Monk Vines in his later years on the porch of the very same house. All the ladies are unrelated. Um, Juanita, his daughter Juanita is the one on the left. thought that was kind of a, a neat picture of him cutting his eyes over uh, to the women. These are their children. The first is uh, Madeline Edna Vines. Um, she was born November 16th, 1908 in, uh, in Bedford. Her mother was only 17 years old. And my guess is they were living in the Vines home on Poor Creek with her husband and then um, Ike Vines and Granny Vines. And Annie was so young, she, um, she must have gone home to her mother to have that baby because she was only 17. And they brought uh, Madeline back uh, as an infant, most likely to the house at Poor Creek. Uh, her father began, according to the journals, her father began uh, scraping and leveling the foundation of the new home at Cold Spring that we've already seen on October 22, 1908. Uh, and according to Granny Vines Journal, Monk and Annie took the little baby out to the new home on Thursday, June 9, 1909. All of her other siblings uh, were born uh, in the house at Coal Springs, except for Eva, who was born in the Greenville home. home. Um, the Greenville home, as we talked about, uh, her father started in 1920 21. Uh, perhaps they moved there to get the children closer to school, and also um, uh, there was no farm there, and Monk was not a farmer, so that may be the reason why they moved to town. Uh, my mother told me uh, one of her first jobs was to work at the chalk mines office where she tested samples for purity. This picture of the chalk mines here. She worked uh, for $5 a week. She told stories about learning to drive at age 13. I know she played some high school basketball, and... Um, 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 enjoyed her family and her parents, and then unfortunately, she was 18 year old, 18 years old when her mother died unexpectedly uh, from post-op bleeding after breast surgery, uh, May 24th, 1927. So she became the woman of the house. And at this time, her siblings were 16, 15, 12, 10, and four years old, respectively. And I think she tried to help them. They tried to help each other. Uh, and their father through that time. She attended Dunsmore um, Business College in Stanton. Dunsmore was sort of like a 1920s version of a community college. It did draw some people from surrounding counties. Some stayed in boarding in Stanton, some uh, rode in. This photo is from her graduation from Dunsmore College. I think she's really pretty here. She kind of reminds me of Whit Whitney Miller. I really like this photo, but it also shows you know, maybe how hard things were at her. She's probably got up that morning fi helping fix breakfast for everybody. She would walk from her home, Greenville, to the station, uh, railroad station in Stanton, ride the train to Stanton, walk from the station to Dunsmore on West Beverly Street. And uh, as she, she couldn't arrive in time for her classes, for two of her classes, so it took her a little extra while to graduate. In the second year, someone had a car. She finally... Um, married her high school sweetheart, uh, Joe Green. This is a picture at Goshen Pass, which we have four generations who really enjoy that place. Madeline's on the right. Uh, my father, Joe Green, is in the center. And Jean Vines is on the left, and she's obviously a cousin of some sort, but I don't really understand. 
Um, they um, were finally married. This is on their wedding day. Uh, I think they were married at the Parsons in Greenville and left. The, I don't. I think it was a matter of economics that they would uh, get married at that time, uh, not to have a, a large wedding uh, as such. Uh, they moved to the Green Farm in Fairfield, Virginia. First child was stillborn, a male. It was buried on the farm, and they had three other children. Uh, Mary Jane, who married uh, Preston Dallas Miller, Becky Joe, who married R. Gregory Porter III, and Joe Green, myself, who married uh, Sandra Lynn Lineberry. She was a wonderful mom and a grandmother. She was also a housewife um, all her life. She didn't really have a job, but that's a hard enough job. She could cook and sew with the best. She sang at the church. She could play piano by ear. She served the community. Arranged church flowers weekly for years. Broke her arm in a fall when she was about 80 when she was taking a box or a boom box or out the back door or to take we, uh, meals on wheels to the elderly at about 79 or 80. So she was quite a woman. The second child was uh, was uh, Juanita Vivian Vines. This is a picture of Juanita when she was young. She was born November 2nd, 1910. Uh, she married Jack uh, John L. Simpson or Jack Simpson and had no children. She died January 31st, 1974. She was always bright and happy, beloved by her nieces and nephews who called her Nia. And we spent vacations with her um, at, at, in her apartment with six people, her single apartment, or at Buckrow Beach. Uh, she was a talented musician. She loved to fish on the pier, and I think she taught us the uh, famous card game demon that still persists in our family. Third child was William McDonald Vines. He was born October 11, 1912. He never married, and he died November 20, 1995. He was named after William A. McDonald, who was a Scotsman in Greenville. He was a real good friend of Monk's, and Monk used to cut um, um, William McDonald's hair, uh, take care of him, took care of him in his old age. And uh, the uh, McDonald's gave the plot of the cemetery, uh, or Mr. McDonald gave the plot in the cemetery to the Vines family, where a lot of these folks could could visit. He was um, he was a dapper guy. He was a he was, he always had shine shoes. He always had a nice nice car. He could sing. He could whistle really well. He was beloved by nieces and nephews who called him Billy Willie. He served in uh, World War II in England. When he was a young man doing all the sorts of work that his father had done, grading roads, packing apples, he was packing apples from their orchard to send in barrels to export to England. He wrote a note in one of these barrels uh, and uh, a year or so later, as a result, he got a letter from a young lady in English in England and um, he kept it, and actually when he ended up going to uh, England in World War II, he looked her up. He worked at DuPont. He was a really smart man. Uh, he worked as a maintenance supervisor in D.C. for a large apartment complex. As he, could, he could fix anything. He loved to fish. He was a great storyteller, um, hunting, uh, um, about hunting and trapping skunks to sell their hides on the train to New York City and picking berries also to sell on trains going to New York. He retired to Lou Ray next to his friends Mac and Winnie Matthews and and their daughter Meg. Billy will like this picture because he is um, it's the old uh, picture where you catch a bunch of little fish and you tie them on a line out there and then you hold your hands and stand way back and it looks like he did really well that day and he would really appreciate that I think. Uh, this is Mary Burns Vines, and my guess is that her father, uh, being friends with Mr. McDonald, probably read a lot of Robert Burns' poems. I don't know of any other Burns that are in the, that are in our family, and that may be where her, where her middle name came from. She was born February 24th, 1917. She died February 3rd, 1982, and she married uh, Stanley uh, Conway Damastis, and she was a wonderful lady. She had a great sense of humor and was always laughing and beloved by the nieces and nephews. Um, we would go to her house, and there she's standing in the yard at Greenville there at the, at the Greenville home on the Lee Jackson Highway. Um, she's standing in the yard there. We would go on Sundays and sit on the porch and swat flies and count cars and, 
and and then just hang out. It was a going home, I think, for my mother, and we would stay with her. She was a wonderful cook. I remember how she would cook eggs, fried eggs, and how her, and watching her hands as she would, you know, butter your toast. It was she was such a such a kind kind woman um, and a lovely lady. Um, they had two children, Stanley Conway Damastus Jr., um, who married um, Esther Coffey, and Mary Sandra Damastus, who married Burl Harvey Patterson. And this is another picture of Mary. I think this is Peggy Penny, who is on the left, and uh, I thought this was a pretty picture of Mary, who is on the right. Um, there are numerous pictures. A lot of people are holding the bouquets. This is not Mary's wedding. This is Peggy Penny's wedding, but everybody would take pictures and hold the bouquet. This is another symbol, and Mary's in the center. And on the left is my mother, Madeline. Um, next fourth child is Jesse um, Willard Vines. Uh, he was born April 9th, 1915. And there was a significant thing happened on April 5th, 8, 1915. There was a huge fight uh, where Jesse Willard fought Jack Johnson at the racetrack in Havana. It was a huge fight. It went 26 rounds. Jesse Willard won, and um, uh, Jesse Willard Vines got Jesse Willard's name. Uh, I believe that's where it came from. Um, he, had, he married uh, Margaret Hulvey, and he had two lovely daughters, uh, Patricia Ann Vines, who married Simon Welcome Knopp, and uh, Jacqueline Burns Vines, who married uh, Mac Chapman Kester. Uncle Jess was a snappy dresser. He had a great smile, uh, and he was very well known in his family uh, for smoking his cigars, which you can see there in his left pocket. I'm glad the cigars made the picture. He worked at DuPont in Waynesboro, and later in life he married Francis Lee Deffenbaugh. He died February 6, 1996. And this is uh, Eva Rebecca Vines, youngest child, and she was only four when her mother died. She had pictures taken there in the yard in Greenville. Uh, she was born June 23, 1922, um, and um, she married R. Kern Utzler, um, who was a bishop in the United Methodist Church and a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. And um, um, she died May 25th. 2014. She always had a twinkle in her eye. She was a really pretty lady. She'd take the train from Greenville to Stanton to attend Mary Baldwin College, and she was the first in the family to get a uh, degree uh, from, from a four-year college. She had uh, two children, Rebecca Ann Utzler, who married William Albert Coulter, Jr., and Mary Margaret Utzler Amaki, who married Raymond Abramson. And um, here's another picture of her. I spent some great time. She was always great company, great fun, uh, vacationing with the Uslers at Buckrow Beach with Juanita and other places. Uh, this picture shows Eva on the right, my mother Madeline on the left. And um, here is uh, Eva on the left with Mary in the center, Madeline next, and my father on the right. They, those three like to chum together a great deal. So, uh, to me, this Vines family generation was really loving among themselves. They didn't. They really didn't have e all have easy lives. They grew up during the Depression. They grew up during World War II, and despite all the hardships, um, you know, they were really kind and loving. And when they came around, you could see it and you could feel it in their eyes how kind they were. And they were great mothers and fathers, and they were great uncles and aunts. And I think all of that generation have. Uh, all of the next generation, which is ours, has benefited and are trying to pass it on to the other folks that are younger than we. And uh, all of the Vines members will certainly have many, many pictures of, of their parents and, and relatives. These are just a sampling of these. Um, uh, and that's really all I, I have about the Vines family and the Dow line. Of course, all of us would have been Dows uh, had uh, Virginia Ann married Major Dow long ago. That would have been our last name. I did a previous DVD on the Green family, and there were a couple pictures I left out. So uh, just as a diversion, here's the Green family crest. I wanted to put, put uh, that in. Uh, also, this was my father. He was a lieutenant colonel in the Army. He went to uh, Japan in World War II. Um, and um, 
this is a picture of the green farm in my last DVD. It was a very, very poor picture. This is on 164 Pleasant Valley Road, Rafine, Virginia, if you want to see where that is. Uh, the farm's still in the family after 100 years. Underneath that is a, a um, 1805 log cabin, and it's been built around um, and looks at, like this today. Um, this home that didn't make the last video or the last DVD uh, was the home uh, when Milton Green's wife died. Uh, they were living at at the um, Pleasant Valley Road home, that farm home in Greenville. I'm sorry, in Rafine, and he had six children, and he moved them to Greenville, and he moved into this house, which is on 15 Church Street. If you want to go see it, it's an unusual house. It was actually built as a hotel called the Melton Hotel. And uh, he moved with his children to town there. Uh, my father, Joe Green, was about 12 to 14 when they moved there after his mother died. And Madeline Green was already in Greenville, so uh, she was there. And also her mother had died, and they um, that's their proximity there. Going to the same school probably is why we're all hanging out here together through that marriage. And... Um, it's also how Milton Green and E.F. Vines would have been together and been buddies. So life in the Shenandoah Valley uh, has been good. The Greenville area uh, is very, very, very beautiful. And um, hopefully these pictures and some of the boring genealogy uh, will benefit some folks down the road.